What image comes to mind when you hear the word vampire? Perhaps it is the classic depiction of Bela Lugosi's Dracula, an elegant, immortal, reclusive figure. Or maybe it's the more feral, animalistic sort, cold, unfeeling, superhuman killing machines, driven only by an insatiable thirst for blood, a creature whose only weakness is exposure to pure silver and sunlight. But is there any truth to these creatures' existence? Surprisingly, yes. In the first half of the 18th century, following the Austrian Empire's seizure of Belgrade and much of Serbia, reports of strange deaths would make their way into the hands of Austrian officials. Unusual reports from Serbian villages, now under the control and supervision of the Austrian monarchy. Villages whose inhabitants were being picked off, one by one, by what was described as an inhuman and unnatural enemy. Austrian doctors and men of science scoffed at these absurd claims, attributing the villagers' strange deaths to some unknown disease. But when Austrian medical officers and soldiers were sent to investigate these deaths and to bring order to what was clearly a population of uneducated and superstitious peasants, these military men quickly realized that the villagers were telling the truth. This is the story of the Austrian army and the vampire. The mist which hangs before you offers you a choice to pass through or to escape. Beyond it are stories which defy explanation and fly in the face of what we know to be real. It is a void of both reality and impossibility, of both fact and superstition. You alone are left to discern what to believe as you pass through what we call the fog of war. In the early years of the 18th century, the Austrian Habsburg monarchy found itself embroiled in a bitter war with the regional powerhouse of the Ottoman Empire. From 1716 to 1718, in what is now known as the Austro-Turkish War, rival imperial forces conducted battle over the Balkans, leaving an estimated 80,000 dead in their wake. The short but violent conflict would culminate in the Austrian capture of Belgrade, forcing the Ottoman surrender and the signing of the Treaty of Pasarovitz. With the Ottoman defeat, the Habsburgs expanded their empire into the Balkan region, the territories of Banat, Alentia, northern Bosnia, and Serbia, then falling under the flag of the Austrian eagle. With new kingdoms to their name and thousands of new subjects under their rule, the Habsburgs set about exploring the Balkan territories. Administrators, explorers, and cartographers were dispatched into the rugged, mountainous land, cataloging everything from geography, wildlife, and the unique social dynamics at play within the regions. <laughs> Located along the banks of the mighty Danube River in northeastern Serbia, just outside the now capital city of Belgrade, the small fishing village of Kisiljevo welcomed one such adventurer in the summer of 1725. Provizar Frumbald, an imperial administrator, was already well into his journey. The humble village, just one of dozens, he was tasked with recording on his way through the Serbian kingdom. However, while studying this little town and its inhabitants, Frumbald would bear witness to what he considered a unique and rather grotesque sort of ritualistic practice. As Frumbald went about his duties, his attention was drawn to an angry crowd of villagers clustered in the town's modest cemetery. Intrigued, the administrator made his way to the burial grounds, nudging his way through the excited mob of people trying to get a better look at what was happening. Finally breaking through the crowd, Frumbald was confronted with a sight both confusing and disturbing. The villagers appeared to be exhuming a corpse, a man recently deceased at about the age of 60. As the burial detail hoisted the man's body from his grave, Frumbald took note of how fresh the buried corpse appeared. The body, despite sporting a layer of dirt, still maintained a lively glow. 
The man's fingernails and hair likewise appeared healthy and intact. Surely, Frumbold thought, showing no signs of bloat or decay, the man couldn't have been buried more than a few hours before his arrival, or perhaps the day prior. What reason would they have, he then pondered, to be exhuming the body now? Quite an unusual practice. Still more strangely, he watched as the villagers grew increasingly riled, hurling curses and spiteful words towards the corpse that now lay on the ground. Others remained stoic, their hands tightly clasped, heads lowered in silent prayer. The bizarre scene made all the more eerie against the backdrop of the priest's passionate readings of scripture and the crowd's jeering took a final dark turn. Reaching into a small crate, one of the men retrieved two items, a sharpened stake carved of hawthorn wood and a mallet. Placing the jagged end of the stake against the corpse's chest, Frumbald watched with bated breath as the man then raised the mallet high above his head. Taken aback by the horrifying display, staring at the wooden stake now deeply planted in the dead man's heart, the administrator couldn't help but be doubly startled by the tremendous amounts of fresh blood now pouring from the corpse's chest, mouth, and ears. Was this man even dead? How could a corpse without a beating heart produce so much blood? The administrator could have even sworn he heard the man issue a low, pained groan when being impaled. Increasingly baffled by the series of events, Frumbald watched as the men set about the final phase of their now apparently well-rehearsed ritual. The men lowered the bloody corpse back into the open grave before setting fire to it. The smell of burning hair and flesh quickly filled the graveyard, the crowd having now become transfixed and eerily silent. As the flames devouring the man's corpse climbed high into the darkening sky, Frumbald asked his guide, about what he had just witnessed. Who was the dead man, and why did his corpse deserve such unusual and seemingly spiteful treatment? The guide, hesitant and pale with fright, explained that they had just witnessed the final execution of what was called a vampire. Observing his look of confusion at the term, the man explained, a vampire, a foul, unholy and predatory spirit who stalks the earth with an insatiable thirst for human blood. Having retired to his evening quarters, Provisor Frumbald began making a detailed report of the day's events, a report which would later be published that same summer of 1725. This official government report is the first documented use of the word vampire in recorded history. Once published, the testimony of the Provisor, further expanded upon by the testimony of locals from Kisilyevo, sent shockwaves throughout the Austrian Empire. But who was the dead man whose ritualistic impalement Frumbald witnessed? According to the document, while he still lived, this so-called vampire was a local man by the name of Petar Blagojevic. Ten weeks before Frumbald's arrival to the small town of Kisoyevo, Petar, then a man of about 60 years of age, was laid to rest after a short bout with illness. In and of itself, this was no cause for concern. However, shortly following Petar's passing, something terrifying was unleashed upon the unsuspecting village. A string of mysterious deaths of several villagers took place in the week immediately following Petar's burial. One after the other, affected individuals would fall violently ill and then die within 24 hours. But far from being a normal bout of plague or illness, on their deathbeds, each victim uttered the same ominous testimony. Petar Blagojevic, at least a monstrous perversion of him, had appeared to them in their dreams, viciously strangling them to within an inch of their lives before they suddenly woke from the terrifying vision. And these were clearly no ordinary nightmares. Within eight days of his burial, nine more villagers were also dead. 
victims of what seemed nothing less than a repeating series of supernatural attacks, an unholy scourge that, without intervention, seemed bound to continue. For the people of Kisilyevo, there was never any doubt about what Petar was and how he needed to be dealt with. Unlike the newly arrived Austrians, the Serbs, alongside their other Slavic brethren, were well acquainted with identifying and disposing of vampiric creatures. If historical accounts are to be believed, Balkan peoples had been dealing with such entities for hundreds of years. In spite of the harsh laws in place that prevented the burning and staking of bodies under the guise of witchcraft, the villagers continued in this gruesome practice. For them, upon exhuming the long-departed Petar, the telltale signs of vampirism were plainly evident. Despite being dead and buried for ten weeks, Petar's flesh maintained its lifelike color, while his fingernails and hair continued their growth. Perhaps the most damning evidence came in the form of fresh blood smeared about the dead man's mouth. Proof, the villagers thought, of the very life drained from their murdered citizens. Killing a vampire was a solemn and grisly task. Prayers are recited before a sharpened stake carved of hawthorn wood is to be driven into the vampire's heart. The wood of the hawthorn tree had long been believed to possess certain spiritual and healing properties. In a final effort to rid the body of the vampire possession, the afflicted individual's remains are then burned. And with that, the vampire of Kisilyevo was no more. Frumbold's account of the Kisilyevo vampire submitted to the Imperial Austrian court in the summer of 1725 gave the Western world its first true glimpse of these terrifying creatures. From there, the incredible story was published in some of Europe's most renowned journals and newspaper publications, further stoking the fears and imaginations of people all over the continent in the following years. Despite the religious laws of the day condemning both the belief in such entities as well as the practice of killing them, it is said that the Holy Roman Emperor himself, Charles VI, took keen interest in these blood-sucking creatures. Not only did he send copies of Frumbald's findings to all the crowned heads of Europe, but ordered that all reports of vampire-related activity be sent directly to the imperial court. Perhaps this is why, six years later, in the winter of 1731, when new reports of mysterious deaths came across the desks of imperial administrators, a swift, militarized response was deemed necessary by Austrian officials. This time, the reports came not from the town of Kisilyevo, but from a remote Serbian village, the village of Medvedja. At first glance, Austrian authorities were more concerned at the prospect of some sort of viral outbreak burning its way through the village inhabitants. However, the reports strangely indicated a number of people had died after only two or three days of falling ill, with no previous signs of disease. Quite mysterious. By order of Lieutenant Colonel Schnetzer, the Austrian military commander in the central Serbian town of Jagodina, a small contingent of medical officers, imperial infectious disease experts, were thus dispatched to the region to investigate the deaths. Spearheading the group of specialists was a man by the name of Glasser. Not one to be swayed by local folklore and outlandish spirituality, Glasser was determined to uncover the truth behind the trouble plaguing the village of Medvedja. By the time Glasser arrived in the village, the number of victims had already reached double digits. Whatever the ailment was, the specialist was alarmed by the fact that, according to witness testimony, Affected individuals barely lasted a day after falling violently ill. Glasser then went straight to the source and, with the help of reluctant villagers, exhumed the remains of several of the recently deceased neighbors. Glasser noted that, quite strangely, despite the most recent victim expiring several days before his arrival, little to no decomposition had taken place and the same could be said for the corpses that were buried weeks earlier. More haunting still was the complete lack of evidence pointing to any known sort of disease or infection. 
There were no sores, rashes, boils, or blisters evident on their skin, while no residue around the mouth or nose indicated any of the expected bodily secretions. As Glasser subsequently wrote off every logical answer in the medical books, the insistent testimony of Medvedev's residents became increasingly harder to ignore. Despite the quelling looks of disbelief that the Imperial specialists gave them, the villagers were adamant that they were dealing with a rampage of at least one, if not several more, vampires. Speaking of asking for help, while we may never have a horde of vampires to contend with, we might still be dealing with our own personal battles. I wanted to quickly say thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. I've previously spoken about my experience with seeking therapy after a rough career transition out of the military a few years ago, and at that time I developed the impression that while it was extremely helpful for me, therapy was just something for people dealing with the things I was diagnosed with, namely depression and anxiety. But when I first signed up for BetterHelp, during their intake questionnaire, I saw that not only was I able to make specific requests, such as asking for a faith-based therapist, they also provided a long list of reasons that I might be considering therapy, many of which I had never even considered. I mean, look at these, finding purpose, gaining self-confidence. The one I absolutely smashed was, I want to improve myself, but I don't know where to start. I quickly got matched to an amazing therapist whose name I unfortunately can't share, but uh, he did say he was going to check out my videos. So, brother, if you are watching, I look forward to our next session, Proverbs 2717, right? We have just had some of the most incredible and uplifting conversations, and with stress between work and balancing my personal life, it has just been so helpful to have someone I can speak with so freely and openly and comfortably. It just helps me get refocused. It's not at all what I expected therapy could be like. And improving myself, that is obviously one of the best investments I could think of for me, my faith, and my family. First, you go to their website. As I mentioned, you'll answer a few questions, and usually within 48 hours, you'll be matched with the therapist so you can get started very fast. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash wartime stories or choose wartime stories during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. All right, back to the plight of our Serbian villagers. When Glasser's report made its way back to the Austrian regional headquarters at the Kalimagdan Fortress in Belgrade, it detailed a unique and dire situation. The infectious disease experts were unable to find any evidence of some sort of viral outbreak. Quite bizarrely, they themselves started to find merit in the locals' vampiric rationale. To worsen things, tensions within the region were now reaching a boiling point as Serbian villagers clashed with imperial authorities who were now actively enforcing laws, banning them from staking and burning the suspected vampires. Whether it was the alarming nature of Glosser's strange findings or the threat of local upheaval, imperial authorities deemed it necessary to muster a military response. In January of 1732, troops from the Honorable Regiment of Foot, under the command of one Baron Felstenbusche, as well as the men of the Honorable Maruli Regiment and the Honorable Alexandrian Regiment, set out from the fortress to the Serbian village. Amongst them was an Austrian regimental field surgeon, Johann Flukinger, who rode along in nervous anticipation. Like many men of science and medicine, Flukinger's rational mind found little merit in the peculiar superstitions and folkloric beliefs of the empire's Serbian subjects. But after reading excerpts of the reports made by the infectious disease specialists who were sent in before them, the surgeon couldn't shake the thought that they were marching into something highly unnatural, or at the very least, something never before witnessed in the realm of medical science. In the name of keeping up public relations with the empire's newest citizens, the Austrians reluctantly entertained the first-hand testimony of the villagers, who appeared sincere and greatly distressed by what they conveyed was nothing less than a life-and-death struggle against supernatural forces. In spite of their skepticism, however, much to the Austrians' bemusement, the villagers' story, bizarre as it seemed, was eerily consistent 
across all of their testimonies. The trouble, the villagers told them, began five years earlier with the death of a local Albanian man named Arnand Paol. Prior to his sudden death, Arnand had privately disclosed to a few of his friends that he had made efforts to protect himself from a vampire's bite by eating dirt from its grave. Going one step further, he told them he had been compelled to exhume the grave's corpse, then smearing himself in the vampire's blood to cleanse himself. Unfortunately, his macabre efforts to ward off vampirism didn't stop him from later falling off of a hay wagon and breaking his neck, nor did they appear to stop him from still inheriting an unholy bloodlust following his sudden demise. About a month after Pale's sudden death, four villagers reported having terrifying dreams in which the dead man appeared, tormenting them. A menacing and sinister grin on his face, his red, beastly eyes leered at them from darkened corners. Soon after these dreams began, the bodies started to pile up. These same four villagers, mere days apart, would all die under identical and ominous circumstances. A terrifying vision followed by a bout of sudden, violent illness. Their lives seeming to be quite literally drained out of them. Having recognized the all too familiar implications, long familiar with the telltale signs of vampirism, the local elders conferred on a plan of action to stop Paol from killing anyone else. Upon exhuming his body, buried 40 days prior, they were greeted with an unnaturally fresh corpse, seemingly untouched by decomposition. More unnerving was the appearance of fresh blood smeared all over the man's body and coffin, freshly dried blood even caked between his lips and teeth. Still more shocking, as a hawthorn stake was driven into his heart, the men claimed that Pale uttered a low, pained groan as copious amounts of more blood flowed from his mouth, nose, eyes, and ears. But even after burning the body and reducing the vampire's remains to ash, despite the next five years passing peacefully, the villagers were greatly discouraged to later realize that their vampire troubles were far from over. With 17 newly dead villagers to account for, Flukinger and his men listened as the villagers described the cause for these more recent deaths. During his 40 days of terror, in which he had fed on the lives of four of his fellow villagers, Arnand, it seemed, had also fed on the blood of several young calves. As these calves had recently matured and been slaughtered, it was the meat of these tainted animals that was blamed for passing the vampire's curse onto those who consumed it. Whatever the cause of these recent string of deaths, it was imperative, the villagers thought, that they stake and burn each and every one of the suspected vampire corpses in order to bring an end to this demonic reign of terror. Prior to the Austrian military's arrival, Serbian locals had already acted, staking and burning one of the suspected corpses before the Imperial officers halted any more rituals. An expert in contagious diseases, Flukinger systematically ordered exhumations and conducted autopsies on all the suspects. In the interest of preventing an epidemic and further panic in the village, he sought a scientific explanation for their sudden deaths and the apparent anomalies in decomposition. Of the corpses they exhumed, the ages of the deceased ranging from men as old as 60 to infants as young as eight days, 10 were found to be in a state of supposed vampirism. As Flukinger and his colleagues worked tirelessly in their examinations, conducting thorough autopsies of each supposed vampire, they found themselves increasingly baffled by their findings. Much like the disease specialists before them, they found no evidence to support the theory of a newfound viral strain being the cause of death. While their organs and brains were clearly dormant, the afflicted bodies to the eyes of the surgeons seemed very fresh and healthy as if they were being kept in a state of suspended animation. With each new cut, warm blood continued to flow from the bodies. Fresh skin had taken the place of old, and in one case, the reports indicate that a woman's body, which was emaciated and thin at the time of her burial, 
appeared to have gained weight. By all accounts, this woman, who the villagers knew had lived her life on the brink of starvation, now seemed to be very well fed in death. Completely dumbfounded and in a reluctant effort to appease the wants of the terrified locals, the Imperial troops yielded to their requests to destroy the bodies. Returning the corpses to their graves, the people of Medvedia then went about their disposal process with cold, unfeeling efficiency. When all was said and done, the bodies of 17 supposed vampires had been staked, burned, and disposed of. And strangely enough, it seemed to work. Supernatural or otherwise, the Austrian troops couldn't deny that the only effective measures that seemed to stem this series of mysterious sudden deaths were these very macabre rituals performed by the Serbs on the corpses. Like their remaining ashes, the vampires of Medvedia, their devilish killings, the villagers' nightmares, these withered away into nothing, leaving the imperial authorities with far more questions than answers. What unearthly forces they must have pondered were at work within the empire's new and unfamiliar territories. Upon his return to Belgrade, Flukinger's completed report, titled Visum et Repertum, Seen and Reported, ignited another fervor. Like Frumbold several years prior, his report similarly acknowledged the existence of vampires. Debates then raged in scholarly, religious, and court circles regarding the nature of these so-called vampire epidemics. Could vampires be real? Did citizens need to fear blood-sucking creatures might attack them in their beds? In which case, was it even safe to live close to a graveyard? Something which was quite common throughout many European settlements at the time. Should the dead be securely interred in high-walled burial grounds outside city limits? Many such fears were quelled around a decade later, in 1746, when Vatican scholar Dom Augustine Calmet concluded in his Dissertation sur les apparitions, that, scripture aside, nobody was rising from the grave. He classified vampires as creatures of imagination, rather than an immediate threat. Over the course of the last three centuries, mankind's understanding of the natural world has dramatically increased. At first glance, historical cases of vampirism are easy to chalk up to a poor understanding of human biological sciences, or even human psychology pertaining to the effects of what is called mass hysteria. Taking into account the lack of what we now consider a formal education, as well as the devout religious beliefs of that time, it certainly wouldn't take much to convince even an entire village that nefarious spirits were running amok. But even still, considering the many contemporary stories of demon possession and supernatural encounters, who's to say that such ancient superstitions are entirely irrational? If such unseen spiritual forces exist, as many believe with all sincerity that they always have, it's evident that they make themselves known through the flesh of humanity. Illness, nightmares, strange visions, and other unexplained afflictions are notably common among such stories. Regardless of the truth behind supposed vampire attacks, what is very real is the almost universal belief in the existence of such beings, not only in Slavic Europe, but the world over. Perhaps, depending on a given culture, such supernatural entities are simply called by different names. Before the Serbs coined the iconic term vampire, these creatures otherwise appeared as malevolent spirits and demonic entities in countless oral histories. Asian, African, North and South American cultures all speak of evil beings hell-bent on consuming the flesh and blood of the living, each with their own supernatural or superhuman capabilities. While the vast cultural tapestry of varying accounts makes it difficult to clearly define what a vampire is, the 20th century interpretation of such beings is likely an amalgamation of certain, relatively consistent traits. 
Far from the unholy creatures described during these encounters in 18th century Serbia, vampires have more recently been depicted as something far more appealing and romanticized. If the Serbian depiction is truer to the vampire's original form, then clearly we have been greatly desensitized by modern depictions of immortal, highly seductive beings with great powers and an intolerance to sunlight. Now, in the 21st century, whatever it is that gives us such confidence in our greater knowledge of the world and all of its unsolved mysteries, vampires are largely dismissed as creatures of fantasy and fiction, a relic from a bygone era of ancient folklore. Even in the Serbian capital of Belgrade, now a modern city, the very legend of the vampire is something most passers-by would roll their eyes at. Nothing but a myth born out of a time of ignorance and paranoia. However, if you were to leave the modern world behind and journey into the rural heartland of Serbia, you would find that the locals' belief in vampires is still very much alive. In 2012, the tiny village of Zorozia in western Serbia was thrown into a state of bedlam when a 300-year-old water mill collapsed. The residents were adamant that the mill housed a dangerous vampire by the name of Sava Savanovic. So convinced were they of the vampire's presence, or at least wary of it, tour guides refused to venture near the mill after sundown. Likewise, the owners of the mill, for fear of disturbing Savanovic, flatly refused to perform regular maintenance on the historic structure. It was this fear and the lack of maintenance that directly resulted in the collapse of the mill and supposedly the release of a very angry, now homeless vampire into the surrounding hills. Terrified that the infamous entity was once again on the hunt for victims, the citizens of Zorozia, calling on hundreds of years of ancestral knowledge, acted as their predecessors once did. Garlic sales in the region skyrocketed as crucifixes and holy icons were placed above the doorway to every home. As a self-defense measure, the villagers armed themselves with sharpened hawthorn stakes in anticipation of direct confrontations with Savanovich. Remaining vigilant for the next seven months, nothing more seemed to come from the matter. The mill was eventually rebuilt, and with the vampire supposedly gone, calm once again returned to the humble village. A passing hysteria, perhaps, but only to an outsider. From our enlightened point of view, it's very easy to be amused by such an incident, to laugh at what we believe are poorly educated country folk caught up in their own ridiculous superstitions and outdated beliefs. However, to the people of rural Serbia, far more familiar with the natural, and unnatural elements of their own homeland, they know better than anyone else that there are things in the region, and perhaps the wider world, that the scientific eye cannot and will never comprehend. A sentiment that rings as true today as it did for the Austrian soldiers and disease experts who, so many years ago, marched into a strange foreign land to confront a series of unusual deaths and strange happenings. They too felt confident in their education in the natural sciences. Soldiers who then marched out of those villages to write official reports which we can still read today. Reports which conveyed not confidence, but bewilderment in their findings. Military reports which, like those men, leave us with only a dark and insidious mystery that by all accounts remains unsolved. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around for the after action on this one. Uh, this episode hits close to home for a couple of reasons. 
One, my first foray into entertainment anything was when I did a theater class uh, my senior year. There was a girl and I wanted to spend more time around her and yeah, so, but then I ended up being stuck in theater. And so the first production we did was Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I starred in as Jonathan Harker. And that really just kind of launched my whole interest in performing arts and that kind of thing. Um, second, our artist here, Pekata, he is originally from Serbia. So he really enjoyed working on this episode and he offered me some additional input into the story as we were working on it. I might have mentioned it previously, but Pekata actually served in the military as well. Coming from a landlocked country like Serbia, I was surprised when he told me he was in the Serbian Navy. So I asked him, how does that work? And he clarified that it was the Serbian River Navy. You learn something new every day. I would have never even contemplated the idea of there being such a thing as a river navy. So if anyone out there has any strange stories pertaining to river navies, by all means, do let me know. I asked Picotta what kind of work he did while serving in the River Navy, and he told me, well, we might have drank once in a while. Just kidding, right? And then he elaborated and said, of course, it wasn't all just drinking. He said that occasionally they would go fishing so that they could eat something while drinking. <laughs> I was starting to, starting to wonder if Picotta might have actually been a pirate. But that does uh, remind me a lot of my own career. You should see what Marines and sailors do to their livers when we would land our ship in port for a few days. It's unbelievable. As to the story, Picotta did say that the present-day town of Medveja is probably not the same village spoken about in the story, seeing as the existing town is much further south in Serbia and would have still been in the Ottoman Empire's territory in the 1730s. So if not the same location, there may have been another village named Medveja somewhere else in Serbia at that time, which is entirely plausible, right? Every country has towns with the same name. The name Medveja evidently means a place where they hunt bears. Uh, one last thing, for several months now, Picotta has intermittently let me know that he's having issues with his iPad while creating the artwork, you know, because we have deadlines and sometimes I'll be asking, like, are you doing okay? And, and he's like, no, sorry, my iPad just crashed. And it's because of new updates or something. It's the, the whole planned obsolescence thing. I guess his iPad is like, he's been using it for six plus years. Anyway, my, you know, my PC crashes every once in a while while I'm putting the animations together in Adobe Premiere. It's infuriating. So I wanted to help him out, and I thought in light of you guys always wanted to help out with the channel and be a part of its growth and the whole process, I thought maybe we could do a fundraiser to get Picotta a better device. Picotta, if you're listening, please don't message me saying this is not necessary. He's the kind of person who will absolutely refuse a gift like this. So Apple is going to drop a new iPad Pro next month in May, and although they haven't posted the price yet, it's looking like it's going to be upwards of $1,800 plus the Apple Pen and other incidentals, taxes, so something in the ballpark of $2,000 plus. If we can't raise all the money, I'm just going to buy him one anyway, but I didn't want to rob you guys of the opportunity to chip in and help out if you wanted to, even if it's just a few cents. So until May, whether you sign up for Patreon or become a channel member or donate through PayPal, I will link that here and in the description section, I will happily match whatever is needed to cover the difference. And tell you what, for every person that does donate from now until May, I will give you all a personal shout out in that Smoke Pit episode that we do that month to immortalize your incredible generosity. So thank you all once again. Thank you to my Patreon and YouTube channel members listed here. May God be with each and every one of you, no matter what you were dealing with. And I will see you in the next episode.